Happy New Year to you. A couple of very significant uh, events, if you will, spiritually significant events are happening in our church today and tomorrow. Uh, Pastor Jason already mentioned that tomorrow we start reading through the New Testament together. Hopefully you've already gotten your journal, your reading plan. If not, uh, you can pick those up today. And uh, I want to tell you something, uh, you know, I'm, I'm committed to and convinced that reading the Bible changes lives, but a study came out just this week that I think says a lot to us about the importance of reading through Scripture, and I'm excited that we're doing that together as a church body. The uh, Center for Bible Enhancement, um, they're an organization that studies the effects of uh, engaging with the Word. They recently completed a study of thousands of people, various ages, various denominations, various uh, nationality, backgrounds, and I want to tell you just very briefly what they discovered. They discovered that the life of someone who engages in Scripture four or more times per week looks radically different from the life of someone who does not. In fact, what they discovered is for people who engage in Scripture one to three times a week, there is very little difference in their lives and the life of an unbeliever. Isn't that amazing? Four or more times a week, and you're radically different. Let me tell you some of the things they found out. Someone who engages the Bible four or more times a week, listen to this, is 228% more likely to share their faith with others. Now, that's significant for where we are as a body and what we're doing today of asking who's the one that God is going to use me this year to share the gospel with. You're 228% more likely to share your faith if you spend four or more days a week engaged in Scripture. 407% more likely to memorize Scripture. 59% less likely to view pornography, anger issues drop by 32%, bitterness in relationships by 40%, alcohol, alcoholism drops by 57%. Isn't that amazing? The impact, just a very practical, simple impact that engaging in Scripture has. And as a body, we're asking you to engage five days a week. Uh, like this week, you're going to start tomorrow with Matthew 1 and read Matthew 1 through 5. And as a body, we're going to be reading through the New Testament together and then Sunday by Sunday engaging uh, in what we're studying. So I really hope that you'll be challenged to do that. Maybe you hadn't thought about it, but I hope this morning uh, you will consider that and you can stop by one of the tables and uh, get signed up and get a journal. Now, the second thing that happens, and we've been building toward this for the last five weeks, today is both a, a culmination and a commencement. We spent the last month of 2019 in a series called Go Tell It, Share the News. And we've been building over those five weeks, we've been building toward this first Sunday in 2020 when we're asking every member, every believer who's a part of our body to commit to getting the gospel to one person this year. So we're going to culminate the series today, but we're going to commence the, uh, the journey or commence the adventure. Now, let me assure you, we're not throwing you off in the deep end without a life preserver. Uh, we will, throughout the course of this year, be offering you helps, be offering you tips, be explaining ways that you can engage, how you can share the gospel. We're going to do that all through the year. We're just looking for today the commitment that I'm going to do what God has called me to do as a follower of Christ. Now, let me do a quick review just to kind of give you the, the foundation of where we started. We began uh, the first week of December in Matthew chapter 4. That was kind of our foundational passage where Jesus called the first disciples. What did he call them to? He called them to be with him and to be like him. As followers, they were to think like he thought, to do what he did, to respond the way he would respond. And you remember we said that, that disciples in the first century, the highest compliment they could get was the dust of your rabbi is all over you. In other words, you're following your rabbi so closely that when he steps on those dirt streets and that cloud of dust billows up, it gets on you. You're following him that closely. And it's interesting that the first disciples Jesus called, if you'll remember, these were men who would not have been invited to follow a rabbi and be his disciple. They didn't have what it took. And yet Jesus came and called them, not because of their, their talents or not because of their abilities, but because of their availability and their willingness to follow. So in Matthew 4, we saw that Jesus called disciples then. He calls disciples now. We're to follow him. We're to be like him. And when are we most like him? Well, Jesus said about himself, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That was his primary purpose in coming. Jesus didn't come to heal. Jesus didn't come to perform miracles. Jesus didn't come to preach great gospel messages. Those were all means to the end. He primarily came to seek and to save the lost. 
And just like those early disciples, we've been called to be disciples, to be with him, to be like him, and to follow him. The second week, Pastor Curtis had us look in Luke 5 in the, in the healing of the paralytic. And you remember that his friends, the paralytic could not get himself to Jesus. His friends had to bring him to Jesus for him to be healed, both physically and also spiritually. And the challenge that Pastor Curtis shared that morning was that we need to serve others well. Why? Because as we serve well, as we meet the needs of people around us, then we have the opportunity to present them to Christ, to introduce them to Christ, to share the gospel message. The third week, we were in Luke 16. You well remember, right before Christmas, the parable of the rich man in hell. And that was to remind us the fate of those who depart this life and enter eternity without relation with Christ. The Gospels and the Bible tell us very clearly that hell is a very real place. It's a place of torment, and it's a place of sorrow and hopelessness and terror and separation and isolation. And we have to remember that good people are going to go to hell. Religious people are going to go to hell. Anyone who does not have a relationship with Christ is going to end up in hell for all of eternity. God doesn't want anyone to go to hell. That was not God's design. When he made hell, it was not made for man. It was made for the fallen angels. God wants no one to go to hell. He wants no one to perish, but all to have the gift of eternal life. God wants to receive the gift of eternal life and then to share it with those who are apart from him. The following week, we looked in the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon, who was the wisest man of his time, journaled in Ecclesiastes his search for, for meaning and value and purpose in life. And through Solomon's eyes and Solomon's experience, we're reminded of the futility of life under the sun. What does that mean? Well, life with no eternal perspective. Life is just looked at on a horizontal, temporal basis without any idea or mention of God. And as Solomon tried to pursue life that way, Ecclesiastes became a very sobering reminder of the reality of the desperation of a life apart from Christ. Fortunately for us, we know that God came. The Word became flesh, John 1, 14, and dwelt among us. God is a God who wants to be known. God is a God who is knowable. Jesus came. You remember Jesus came and he lived among us? Jesus came and he demonstrated God's love to us, and Jesus came and he led us to the Father. How? By dying for our sins, by paying the price for our sins so that we could have relation with God, which is what he made us for. And in our relation with him, we find life truly. We find meaning. We find purpose. We find fulfillment in life. You may remember the other thing we discussed that week was that in the pattern of what Christ did, we find our purpose in life. He lived among them. He loved them. He led them to the Father. That's the same thing we're called to do as his followers, to live among the people he has placed us around. What, what does that mean to live among them? To get involved in their lives, to let them get involved in our lives to love them, to demonstrate the love of the Father to them, and then, as God provides opportunity, to lead them, to explain the gospel message to them, and lead them to saving faith. And then finally, last week, Pastor Jason, in my absence, pointed us to Paul's word in Philippians 3, where Paul challenged us to press on and to strain forward toward the goal or the prize, leaving behind both past mistakes and past victories. And as we look into 2020, we, we need to ask the question, what are we pressing toward in 2020? Hopefully, we are pressing toward being more like Jesus, being fully devoted followers of Christ. And, and do you understand that circles back to where we started in Matthew 4? To be with him, to be like him, to follow him as closely as we possibly can, and specifically to be fishers of men to, to seek the lost. Pastor Jason also mentioned last week in Philippians 4 that Paul is, is, Paul is nearing the end of his life, and as he's talking about what he loves most in life and, and what brings him the greatest joy and what uh, his trophies were in life, if you will, it was the people that he impacted with the gospel message. You know that there are only three things mentioned in Scripture that will last for eternity? Everything we have here on this earth is temporal. It's all going to burn, but three things will last for eternity. They're the Word of God. Any investment of the Word of God you make in your life or the lives of others, the Word of God's going to last for all eternity. Godly character is going to last for all eternity. And then most importantly, the souls of men will last for all eternity. If you want to make an investment in your eternal future, you're wise to consider what will last for all of eternity. But as we lean into 2020, we're going to lean into Christ's likeness. We're going to lean into God's purpose for us as followers of Christ and what it looks like to really be a disciple of Christ. And we're going to lean into making an impact on men and women with 
the gospel. So, the question we've been leading up to for the last five weeks, the, uh, the question that we come to this morning, the question before every one of our staff members, every one of our pastors, the question before every Sunday school teacher, every small group leader, every leader in any role in this church, the question before every member, every believer in Christ who is gathered here this morning is very simply this, who's your one? Who's your one? You may have several friends or you may have several family members that you're concerned about, but you know, you can kind of get overwhelmed by all that and think, well, I don't even know what to do, where to start. I'm going to tell you where to start. It's to pick one, the one that God has most burdened your heart with. Who's the one person that you will totally focus on in 2020, that you will make significant investment into their life? Who's the one that you're going to make every effort as God enables you to reach for Christ in 2020? Now, you're not going to go it alone. Uh, we're going to be in this with you all the way because we're, we're a body, because we serve and we work together. And, and our commitment as a body, when you say, this is my one, our commitment is to diligently pray for you and for your one. Let me tell you how that happens. It happens in staff meetings every week. Every week as our 20 or so on the pastoral team gather, we all take one of those names and we pray aloud all at the same time. We call those names out before the Lord and we call your name out before the Lord if you turn that name in, that God will provide opportunity and the Holy Spirit will lead and guide you and give you the words you need to say. That happens in other meetings that we have. That happens uh, because our, our prayer team gets some of those names every week. And of course that happens in here uh, many Sunday mornings that we take time in our service to call out those names names and to pray for their names. Listen, we must never forget the power of prayer. You know, tonight, once a month, we gather as a body simply to pray. And tonight is our, is our night for January to gather. We'll be up in the venue where we have kind of some room to move around. And tonight, we're going to begin, one of the things we'll do tonight is begin praying for the names that you're turning in this morning. We're very serious about praying for those who need to know Christ because prayer is the powerful weapon that's going to make a difference in hearts and lives. Just a few weeks ago, I heard an incredibly encouraging story on the power of persistent, consistent prayer. And I want you to hear that story and reflect on that this morning. When I was around two and a half years old, my mother remarried and um, she married my stepfather, Daniel Moore. And uh, as I grew up, I come to know the Lord in my teenage years and started to realize that my stepfather needed the Lord. And um, I started praying for him. I even asked him personally, um, do you know the Lord? The first time I asked him that question, he cut me off and said, that's a personal thing. Even though I could see no results for my prayers. I continued to pray for my dad because I could see that he needed the Lord. He needed the Lord just like we all do. And I have literally prayed for him over 35 years for his salvation. So recently, like in November, he started having chest pains again and he was rushed to Celine and then um, they transferred him to St. Vincent's. Um, at that point, to me, after he got in the hospital, he started going downhill a little bit, and I was very, very concerned. We did get him in, in a rehab at Alcoa Pines Rehab Center. December the 11th, I went to see him at Alcoa Pines, and I walked in, and he looked pretty good, and we were talking, and he looked at me and he said, I'm reading a book. And I said, you're reading a book? <laughs> I've never seen my dad read a book. Newspaper, yes. Book, no. And he pulled out the New Testament out of the top drawer of his nightstand. And I just did not know what to do. Laugh, cry, raise my hands, <laughs> praise the Lord. I was just totally blown away. And even since then, Glenn and I have been up to see him. And he makes sure he tells me, I'm reading this book. I'm still reading this book. And Glenn actually saw where 
he had dog-eared some of the pages. And I know he's reading it. And he told me he's talked to God. And I know if he's not saved now, the door is open. It's wide open. I uh, will be talking to him more about it. But at this point, I am just happy that I was so diligent in praying. 35 years is a long time. 40 years is a long time. And I'm not going to quit praying for my other family members. I am just, I, I just praise the Lord and, and I thank Him every day. Appreciate Gail sharing that. You know what's significant? If you heard what she said, she talked to God and she talked to her dad. Some of you have been praying many years just like Gail. Please don't give up. Please don't quit. But also understand that we not only pray, we not only talk to God about our loved ones, but we also talk to our loved ones about God. So our part as we begin this venture is we're going to pray consistently and we're going to pray faithfully with you for those that you want to see come to Christ. We're going to pray for you. And then your part, of course, is to trust the Holy Spirit to guide you to develop a relationship uh, to look for ways to love them, to look for ways to demonstrate the grace of the Lord to them, and then to trust the Holy Spirit to lead you to ultimately speak up. And you may say, well, I've never done that. I don't know what to say. You don't have to worry about that. Jesus, when he sent the disciples out, if you look at Matthew 10, when he sent the disciples out for the first time on their own, told them, you're going to be hauled in before kings and those in authority. And he said, don't worry about what you'll say, because at that time, the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say. You just have to be willing to let God burden you and, and to make the choice that you're going to do this and at the right time he will show you and, and he will tell you what you need to say. Well, what, what difference does it really make for us to make a commitment like this? You know, there are a lot of stories that I could share with you this morning about the impact of one, but I'll, I'm going to show you a biblical account of the impact of one. Let me ask you to turn this morning to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. There's this guy here in John 1 named Andrew. Andrew was a disciple of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was his mentor. Uh, they were together all the time. And on this one particular day, um, while, he's with, while Andrew's with John, Jesus comes by. And John mentions to Andrew and another disciple who was there, look, that's the Messiah, that's the Lamb of God. And, and Andrew immediately leaves John, who he's been following, John, who's his mentor, and begins to follow Jesus. Now, I'll tell you, that didn't bother John at all because John's whole purpose was to point people to Jesus anyway. But look in John uh, chapter 1, beginning in verse 35. It says, The next day again John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following, and he said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, or teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, or the Christ. He brought him to Jesus Jesus looked at him, Peter, and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You'll be called Cephas, which means Peter. Now, here's what I want you to see this morning out of this passage in John 1 as we're moving toward our commitment of one. Look again down in verses 41 and 42. Verse 41 says, The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon, Verse 42, and he brought him to Jesus. A Andrew was an inviter. Did you know that studies have shown that 96% of people who will show up at a church like this, 96% show up because someone invited them? Look up and down your row where you're seated. Look at the empty seats on that row. You know what it would take to fill those seats? Just an invitation. 96% come because someone invites them. They're, they're invited by a friend or by a neighbor, by a family member, by a work associate, but they're invited and so they come. Now, that, that's pretty simple, isn't it? Andrew was also a bringer. 
You see it there in verse 42. He brought him to Jesus. Some people you can simply invite. They'll meet you. They'll show up. Some people you have to bring. Hey, can I come by and pick you up? Can I take you to church today and lunch after? Andrew was also an introducer. What do you think about this for just a minute? If you're, if you, this happens all the time around here. If you're standing out in one of the hallways and you're talking to a friend and another friend shows up and they don't know each other, what's very natural for you to do and what, what's good manners for you to do? You introduce them, right? Andrew met Jesus and then he took Simon and introduced Simon to Jesus. Now let me ask you a question this morning. And sometimes I ask questions and I, I tell you, hey, don't, I'm not looking for a Sunday school answer here, okay? This question, I'm looking for a Sunday school answer. Who's your best friend? Really? That's the right answer. So if Jesus is your best friend, if that's what you would say this morning, then the next question would be, so have you told any of your other friends about your best friend? Most of us are here in this room this morning. Most of us ha have arrived at Geyer Springs. Most of us attend this church because someone invited us. Now, there are a few people who just drive by and see the sign, or maybe they get on the web and do a search, but the vast majority of us who are part of this church body, whether you've been here this your first time, or you've been here a week, you've been here 50 years, the vast majority of us are here because someone told us, someone invited us. And I would dare say that probably upwards of 95% of us know Jesus because someone introduced us to Jesus. Very few people pick up a Bible or, or see a track or on the, all on their own come to faith in Christ. Most people have someone who invited them, who introduced them to Jesus. So here's Andrew. You know, if you study Andrew's life, if you look through Scripture, and it, it won't be a very long study, a very long look, he's only mentioned about five or six times in, in all of Scripture. It's kind of, kind of an unsung hero. He's, he's kind of obscure. He kind of lived in the background. You don't see a lot about him like you do about some of the other disciples. But what's significant about Andrew was he saw the value of one. As soon as he met Jesus, he, he went and got his brother, Simon Peter. There's no record in the Gospels of Andrew preaching to a crowd. In fact, what we just read is the only mention of Andrew bringing someone to Jesus, and he brought just one. Now, think about the one he brought, and I can't possibly cover all of it, but think about the significance of the ministry of that one, Peter. Peter preached at Pentecost, and 3,000 people were saved. Peter healed the, uh, the, the, the cripple at, at the temple compound, and people rushed to hear, and he proclaimed the message, and on that day, there were 5,000 men who became a part of the church. All through Peter's ministry, people were healed, and many people came to faith because of his ministry, and Peter became the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And Andrew brought Peter to Jesus. I kind of picture Andrew from what little bit you see in Scripture being kind of quiet and kind of timid and kind of shy. But listen, Andrew brought Peter to Jesus, and I'm convinced from my understanding of Scripture and the reward we receive when we get to heaven, I'm convinced that everything that was part of Peter's ministry and everyone that Peter reached through his ministry with the gospel, that goes to Andrew's credit as well. Some of you are here this morning, you think, well, I'm, I'm kind of quiet, I'm, I'm kind of reserved, I'm kind of shy, I, I'm not sure. Listen, Andrew, in spite of all of that, in spite of being a, a background guy and kind of an unsung hero and not a key player among the disciples, Andrew saw the value of one and the world has been impacted with the gospel simply because he brought one, he brought Peter to Jesus. Well, my neighbor is, is certainly not going to do things like Peter did, right? My neighbor's not going to turn out that way. You don't know my neighbor. You don't know my family. You don't know some of the people I know at work. No, I don't know, but God knows. Who knows what God will do for the one person that you decide to go all out for and reach for Christ? Well, let me bring it a little closer to home. Marcy Walker, I want you to join me up here. Marcy sent me an email this week, and probably after this, none of you will ever send me an email again, because when I got her email, I said, you're going to have to join me on the platform Sunday morning. Marcy's been in our church about 15 years, used to be Marcy Miller, but now she's Marcy Walker. Uh, she and her husband Chad have a son, Colt. Where's Colt? He was in here a minute ago. Yeah, he was 
it was time for him to go back. Oh, time to go back. Okay. So Marcy's been in our church about 15 years. She and Chad, uh, they do several things around here, but most significantly, they lead one of our uh, young adult couples classes, do a very effective job at that. But Marcy sent me this email this week, and uh, I'd kind of forgotten about this, but about three years ago, we were doing an evangelism series, and uh, one of those weeks, we were talking about how simple it is to strike up a, com- strike up a conversation over coffee, over a meal. And I don't know if you'll remember this, but, but everyone, there were napkins, and everyone had a napkin. And I said, I want you to write down on your napkin one name of someone you want to see come to Christ. And, and Marcy did exactly that, and it didn't stop with, uh, with writing the name down. She admits that the name she wrote down, um, she had some serious doubts about. In fact, I think you said it would take a miracle for this person to come to Christ, right? Yes, yeah, so um, a little background. Uh, she, was, she was um, known as <laughs> uh, the crazy lady at work, pretty okay. much. And... Um, Just some insight into some of her struggles. She um, just had a lot of anger, rage, um, deceitfulness, revenge, uh, just a lot of deep struggles. And honestly, I I wouldn't have believed some of the things that she had done had I not seen it personally um, at work. So, Okay. So despite all that, you began to look for opportunities to, to invest in her and build a relationship. What are some of those things that you did? Well, I, I definitely wanted to keep her um, on my good side, so I kept things really light, and we would do a lot of encouraging talks. I would uh, start a little Bible study where I would send sermons or write now media videos and just open up dialogue about the Lord, and we would have a text thread to say, you know, what we got from those Bible studies, and um, and really, she's, she's a single mom with two special needs kids, so I would listen to her struggles, and it just gave me opportunities to speak encouragement and scripture and prayer over her in those difficult times. Now, you, you mentioned um, that she had a relation with Jesus by association. In other words, you were saying because she grew up in the South, she would basically tell you that she knew Jesus, but, but you knew better. Yeah, there was a lot of things that she would say that um, I think because she was raised in the South and had heard about God a few times that in her mind, gave her a relationship with Christ. And so um, just a lot of false things that she would say in conversations that made me realize that um, she didn't have a true relationship with Christ. All right, so you you stayed in there, you kept working with her, and then this big turning point came. Tell about that. Yeah, so about four months ago, things really hit the fan at work. And um, really all of those struggles and and dark issues that um, I had mentioned earlier happened to um, some co-workers and myself included and um, it was all revealed and really it gave uh, a lot of the people at work an opportunity to pull away from it what they mm-hmm. felt like was a toxic relationship but you you saw the need was not to turn away yes it what was, did you do uh, by God's grace he gave me the eyes to see that just her lostness, and I felt sorry for her, and she was really broken about what had happened, um, really because everyone had turned away, and she Mm. saw that she didn't have anybody, and so it really allowed an opportunity to speak um, Christ's forgiveness in her life. Good. All right, so about that same time, you're going through experiencing God. That was before we did that as a church, but you're going through, and one particular Monday morning, you're praying that you'll see where God is at work and know how to join in there, so tell about that Monday. Yeah, so one of the eye-opening things that I took from experiencing God was that I can do a lot of good things for him and say, I'm going to do this, God, will you bless it? And really the mentality needed to be that God is always working and to look for where he's working and join in with that. So I remember that Monday morning praying on my way to work and and just knowing that this was my mission field and God, I really wanted to see where you were working and and let me see that so I can join in. And uh, that Monday morning, I I walked into her office first thing and and she's playing Christian music and had posted Bible verses on her her wall. And I just, I mean, I said, wow, okay, thank you, Lord. And uh, we spent the whole day and several weeks after that, just really um, diving into the gospel and, and what Christ did for her life and uh, was able to walk her through the salvation process. She prayed and accepted Christ. And then um, actually in two weeks, I'll be able to be a part of her baptism. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. All right. There's more. 
Tell everybody what she's been doing since she came to Christ and what her burden is. Yeah, so now all the people who were talking about the crazy lady at work is going, what has happened to her? Um, they've, they've noticed a change, and it's, it's really been incredible. And uh, for me, what I'm seeing is she's, she's on her own listening to sermons and talking about different um, Bible studies that she's involved in at her church. And... Uh, recently she came to me and she said, um, I'm reading through Revelation. And I thought, wow, <laughs> most Christians don't, <laughs> they kind of punt that Bible, yeah. <laughs> um, that part of the Bible. Uh, but, you know, it re- was interesting is she didn't really talk to me about all these theological theories about Revelation. What she took and what the Lord allowed her to see is that um, there's eternity at stake. Mm-hmm. And um, so she just really became burdened for the lost and, um just really she doesn't even have to have the challenge of who's your one she's already looking and wanting to share and she's just so burdened for um for those that are lost that will spend eternity away from christ so your burden for that one is going to multiply who knows how Mm -hmm. god only knows yes all right so you're pretty excited about having one again this year yes yeah so uh really i'm just trusting the lord that you know how he revealed and laid her on my heart that that the person that he's laid on my heart, he's already working or will work in their life. And I just need to, to continue to pray to look for those opportunities um, to join him in that. And, and really just excited for the body to grow together as we seek the Lord. And most importantly, as God grows his kingdom, yeah. his lost souls. It's kind of encouraging out. to be all in it together, mm-hmm, isn't it? Definitely. Good. Thank you for sharing your story yes. with us. Thank you. So what we're talking about is uh, praying. Hopefully most of you have already done that over the last five weeks. Some of you may not be ready this morning. That's fine. I'm going to ask you to continue to pray. But we're talking about praying, uh, getting involved in that person's life, living life with them, letting them in your life, getting in their life, and they're looking for those opportunities. You know, and there are lots of ways you can get involved with them. If, if you're a, a lady and there's a, a ladies' outing or something you can invite, you can Men, take them golfing or hunting. Ladies can do that, too. Ooh, almost messed up right there. You can take them golfing or hunting. You can have them over for a meal. You can take them out to lunch. Lots of simple ways. I don't have to tell you how to build a relationship, get involved in someone's life. But then ultimately, letting God, letting the Spirit of God show you when the opportunity is right and letting him speak through you to share the message of the gospel. As Marcy said, it wasn't a one-time conversation. It was a process as God worked on this young woman's heart, it was a process, and then Marcy got to be a part of seeing her come to Christ. All right, let me ask you to uh, take the card that was in the bulletin when you came in, and, and uh, the venue, as well as here in the blended service, I want you to, to take that card. As I said, um, maybe you haven't been here the last five weeks, or maybe you hadn't spent time praying about it. Please, please don't fake this. Don't just throw one name down. I'm asking you this morning to make a very serious, very significant commitment that if you ask us to pray for someone, that you're going to do everything you can. All right, look at the card. It's got a a place to write in, a blank to write in the name. Let me say this to you. You'll notice on the bottom of the card it says it can be shared publicly or pastor and staff only. It may be someone that you have concern. They might be here and and hear that you're praying for them. They may be in our church, and, and they don't know the Lord, and you know they don't know the Lord, but you don't want us saying... Uh, their name or putting their name on the screen. So you can put, you don't want that shared publicly. You can also put an alias down. Um, If you want to use a different name for that person, that's fine. God knows who they are as we pray even for that alias. God knows who they are. But put their name there. Um, If you would, kind of tell us what the relationship is. We want your name and email address because, as I said, we're praying not only for that one person, but we're praying for you and and the opportunities that you will have. The reason we want your email address, we're we're not going to bug you, but from time to time, we'll send you an email with, hey, here's some tips, here's some thoughts, here's some things to think about in relationship development. We just want to be able to offer you some help um, with that. And then we do need, need you to mark if you attend the blended service or if you're in the modern service, because as we bring those names up to pray each week, we want to bring them up in the service that you attend. So if you would mark blended or modern. Now, on the back, this is optional. If you want to, if you know the specific need or, or maybe the thing that is kind of a hindrance to this person coming to Christ, maybe they've been through a divorce, um, maybe it's, it's a child whose parents have split up, Maybe someone's had a death in their family. They're angry with the Lord. If you know a specific 
block or hindrance them coming to Christ, and you want to tell us that just in a sentence or two, that will help us know um, how to pray specifically for them. That information will not be shown anywhere on screens or anything like that. That's just for us and for the prayer team who pray privately and individually to know. All right? So if you would, let's fill those out right now in each of our services. I'm not saying you can't turn in a name after today. You certainly can. But we want today to be our launch point um, for those that God is going to enable us as a body to reach for crisis next year. Okay? So if you would get those filled out. In just a moment, um, we're going to have a time of committing these names to the Lord, and I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Curtis, who is in the, uh, in the venue leading the modern service, I'm going to ask Pastor Curtis to lead that time there in that service.